if uh, you have your Bibles with uh, you, let's, let's begin in Mark chapter 5. I have a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. Mark chapter 5, we're going to begin at verse 25. And as you're turning there, um, I just let you know I am uh, from Dayton, Ohio. Some people have asked where that is. And if you know where Cincinnati, Ohio is, it's an hour north of Cincinnati. Um, if you don't know where Cincinnati is, some people say, I don't know where Cincinnati is. And most people know where Columbus is in the center of uh, Ohio, which uh, Dayton is uh, southwest of Columbus. And it's about eight and a half hours from here. In Mark chapter 5, verse 25, Everybody have that? Say amen. Amen. Um, my message, as I said earlier, if you heard me, was I titled it Obtaining Revival in the American Church. Um, I also thought about talking or describing it as revival in the American church um, or obtaining God. I like that kind of better, though. Obtaining God in the American church. And you're going to hear me say American church quite a bit. Um, and we'll get into that a lot more. In Mark chapter 5, verse 25, it says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came into the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she, that she was healed of that plague. For a moment, if you indulge me with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your holy word. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done in this conference already, Father. I know speakers have already said that we can just leave now, and Lord, we've had enough truth that, Lord, it should, it should change and transform us. And God, I just pray as we hear more truth today and tomorrow, that, God, we would be changed that much more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father God, as always, that your Son will be lifted up through this message. That your words would be heard, Father God, by the Holy Spirit. That your Spirit, Father God, would search us and know us and try us, Father God. And if there would be any kind of wicked way in us, any darkness in the depths of our being, in the, dark, in the darkness areas of our heart that we have not searched out, I pray that your Spirit would find those areas in me and each of us, Father God, that we may be whole and holy in your sight, Father. And we just pray, again, that you would glorify Jesus Christ through this. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I know many times we've heard this message so, so much, but it, I actually forgot to read one verse there. In verse 30, it says, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that the virtue had gone out of him, turned him about and impressed and said, Who touched my clothes? Before I actually get into this, I, I was thinking about years ago when I was in a pastor's conference in, in Ohio. And to me, I guess it was a, a mini revival. It was a, a mini move of God, so to speak. It was, it was one day that this happened. But I remember in the, in the conference, um, we, they weren't even talking about revival. They weren't pressing revival. It was just a, you know, just a regular conference, a pastor's conference. Nothing super special, I guess. But suddenly, and that's what always happens, it seems like in real revivals throughout history, that suddenly something happened. And it was an unbelievable, I guess, force, something from above. You know, Solomon said, oh God, if thou would rend the heavens and come down. And that's exactly what happened in that very moment. God came down for that very moment in time. As the song was being played, and I guarantee you it wasn't the name of the song, what the song was. It was something that God was doing in the hearts of all these men and women and I began looking around, and people were just uncontrollably weeping and weeping. I mean, there was pastors from literally all over the world. Some, I remember one pastor uh, from the country of uh, Russia. 
He was there with broken bones, a metal plate in his head, because of all the persecution he has withstood being a, being a missionary in Russia. And I watched that man stand up. With, the, he said virtually almost every bone in his body was broken because of being a missionary over the years. He could barely walk. But because the presence of God in that meeting was so strong and so prevalent, I watched this man stand up and lay prostrate on his face. That was unbelievable. To, to, I know because the pain that he would have to feel in order to do that. That's how strong God, men, became, men and women all over the entire sanctuary became, were prostrate on their faces. I looked it over at my friend of mine named Maynard, and he was a farmer. I looked over at him, and he was, his face was blood red. He was shaking, and tears were coming down his face. And as soon as I looked at him, and I was looking around, I was like, oh my gosh. God's here. It was something I prayed about for years and longed to, to, to be in that kind of a service. In Mark chapter 5, we read about this woman with the issue of blood. And I've heard this preached, you know, in, in different directions, in different ways. And as I was preparing this message for this day, for this time, it occurred to me, and it literally popped in my mind, that when I read about this woman, and often the woman is referred to as the church in the Bible, that this woman, who saw after doctors for many years, who had an issue, and went from doctor to doctor, doctor to doctor, looking for help, and couldn't find it. And her condition grew worse and worse and worse. And then I began to realize, as I think about the church today in America, She's looking for an answer, and she can't find it. And I mean that. She's looking and looking and looking and looking. And we we'll often refer Jesus as the great doctor. And so here it is, the church is going from doctor to doctor, doctor to doctor, false fires, false doctors, not finding the right cure. And she's growing worse and worse and worse and worse. How do I know she's growing worse? And how do you know she's growing worse? Because America's growing worse. Amen. I'm really, I can get going and I skip through a lot of my message too quickly, so I've got to be careful. But that's exactly, when I see that, I see the American church getting worse. Going in all the wrong directions, Finding all the wrong answers. The American church, just like this woman, is always looking for the next great invention. They're always looking for something that's going to build the church and bring the people in. We've known that for years. That's exactly what the church is trying to do. Go for numbers rather than saints. That's right. And the woman has suffered many things. The American church is and has suffered, and she's lost respect, beloved. She's lost respect, she's lost power, and she's lost her way. The Bible never says, turn to God, to the church. He says, return, because we've already turned once. Now we have to return to him. It's a returning back to the Lord which we call revival. And so the woman with the issue of blood got to Jesus, as we just read, and until the church in America gets to Jesus, when she gets to Jesus, she's going to find the answer. Amen. When she gets to the cross, she has found the answer. And that's exactly what my message really is about. The church needs to get back to the cross, the old rugged cross. And is A.W. Tozer, anybody have heard of A.W. Tozer here? A.W. Tozer said, let us preach the old cross and we will know the old power. I like that. And that's what I'm trying to say. The church needs to get back to that old cross because that's where the old power is. There's still power in the blood. And there's still power in that old rugged cross. But we have to get back to that power. And that's getting back to Jesus Christ. The old saying we see bumper stickers, Jesus is the answer. I wish the New Testament, oh, I'm sorry, I wish the American church would realize that. It's in the Word of God. It's in the Holy Spirit. It's trusting in the Lord. 
It's declaring the whole gospel, not bits and pieces of it. Amen. So, where are we at in the American church? Well, right now, all across America, we've already mentioned just a little bit, but there's alarm bells sounding off because of our financial crisis. And those of you who are from America, you've heard the alarm bells sounding off. We may be in a financial crisis. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not being hurt right now. Praise God. But I know Wall Street is. And I know people who have stock in Wall Street are hurting. But it's all we hear about for, what, three or four weeks now? About this crisis that the Wall Street is in and I totally agree. It may be a financial crisis. But what about the spiritual crisis we're in? What about declare a spiritual emergency? And I believe wholeheartedly, I don't know about you, I believe this conference is geared toward that. This is the alarm. This is the sounding of the alarm. This is declaring an emergency. Now we need revival again. We need to see the church revived. Plain and simple. If anybody thinks that we're not in some kind of, if, if anybody thinks we are not in an emergency, if anybody thinks that we are not in some kind of desperation in the church, then they're out of touch with the Spirit of God. They're out of touch with the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Alarm bells are going off everywhere for the financial crisis, but we are hearing very little alarms going off for the spiritual crisis, for the spiritual declension in the churches throughout America. In an age of secular churches. I know we can get a whole lot of amens on that one. Leonard Ravenhill said once, salvation of America doesn't depend on the White House. Salvation of America depends on God's house. And that's right. And I also agree with Leonard Ravenhill again, where he said that America suffers for the sin of the church, which I've already talk, talked about that already. It's God's house that is supposed to be the salt and the light. But the light has faded so dim today, you can barely see it. The churches in America can't solve their own internal issues, let alone the external issues outside. Amen. We've got so much bickering and biting and gossiping we, can't, we have so many internal issues that we won't even confess that we have. I read, I read once in an old-time book, let two people bickering back and forth, let them see a lion in the distance, and they'll stop fighting. Right, that's true. If we can get our eyes and see what the enemy's doing, seeing that lion, which he's known as a lion anyway, we would stop bickering. And I'm not trying to be the doom and gloom. But there's a frustration. I know in your heart and my heart, I've heard other people talk that we're so sick and tired of the way things are going. <coughs> and the situation in America is getting worse. And for a moment, I want to talk. Um, about the American church, a little bit in detail, and then I want to get into some revivals of past and present, and we'll wrap it up. Some years ago, people in churches, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I don't know how long exactly, said something like this. We realize the church, the church is out of touch with America. So we need to make it more relevant. I don't know if any of you have heard that. We need to make it more relevant because it's more, it's out of touch. I've heard people say that to me more than one time over the years. And this is my response to that statement. So for 2,000 years you are saying the church has been in touch, but for the last 10 or 12 years we've gotten out of touch. You follow me? 
See, the American church 10 or 12 years ago, when someone said, let's make the church more emergent, more relevant, more in touch, was already sleeping as it is. That's right. That's right. Was already sleeping. That's right. So what the enemy, this is what I believe, what the enemy, I believe, in his subtlety, what the enemy has done, he's created an insurance policy. Let's put some insurance on this, and let's make them more cozier, more asleep, so they will not wake up at all. So we've created the, the relevant church. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be relevant, but we've taken relevancy to a new extreme. We've got the postmodern churches, we've got the emerging churches. If you study their beliefs, it's way off the charts. I mean, they're not even in left field, they're out by the ballpark. So basically, the enemy has come and said, let's just try to make this church overall, the American church, a, a country club mentality. That's right. In the emergent church, it's emerging into hell. That's where it's emerging to. I've never been a very popular pastor. Preach it, brother. You're right. <laughs> never have been. Don't care to be either. But relevancy, listen to this. Rele this is some of the studies. But what I'm getting ready to say to you right now is some of the facts of exactly what's been going on. It's been written. It's been noted. It's been uh, factualized that the, that the relevancy, the extremism in the American church has done this. Many reports said that they've entertained. Right. Sermons have got wittier. Music lyrics, lyrics have got catchier. Meat and potatoes theology took a back seat years ago. Now we've got the cool church. That's right. You see signs all over, at least in my neck of the woods. You know, there's a sign near Cincinnati that I, it's, it's hard for me to read. And the sign literally says this, and it's a massive big sign on the side of the road because it's a really big church. And it says, if you hate church, you found the right church here. That's, that's where we're going. And that church is full of people. And it's pulling in people. The 18 to 35 year olds primarily. It has a heaven with no hell. And their mentality is what will I get out of Sunday? What will I get out of Sunday? Re to them, revival meetings are primitive. It's in the old past. And what do you have to offer my family? Church. You know, how do I know that? My old mentor pastor years ago told me a funny story, not really funny, but someone called his church, and he had a large church, and someone called, and the secretary answered the phone, and the gentleman had the audacity to say, what does your church have to offer me? And the, the secretary looked at Pastor Frank, and she told him what he said, and he grabbed, he grabbed, he grabbed the phone, and he said, buddy, well, I know what he wanted to say, but he said, what we have to offer you is Jesus. That's it. That's, that's, that should be it. We have to offer Jesus Christ. Revival, mean, revival meetings are primitive, they say, because it's not new age. We have people calling churches saying, is your church relevant? We have churches today... All across America, raise your hands if you want to be saved. I was in a church recently. I saw a pastor uh, gave an altar call. He said, raise your hand if you want to be saved. And everybody clapped their hand when someone raises their hand if they want salvation. This guy, this kid, probably 15 years old, raised his hand. I'm not, I'm not being facetious. He literally, this, this, is a, this is, pretend this is a video game. He's playing a little DX or whatever you call it, a, a, a video game. He's going like this. He's punching buttons, and as he hears that call, raise your hand if you want to be saved, he goes like this. Everybody's clapping their hands. As soon as his hand went back, down, he's playing a video game. You know what that church does? They mark it down as a, as a salvation for the year. But that's what's going on. And that's not, I, I, I know it's not everywhere. Praise the Lord, it's not everywhere. But that's happening more and more and more. It's like we've already heard many times already that repentance is not too popular today. Vance Havner, anybody heard of Vance Havner? Vance Havner said 
a preacher who preaches on repentance today better have his head pledged towards heaven because the people are going to want to take it off. And that's true. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, and when I see the Corinthian church, I see the American church. We are fools for Christ's sake, he said, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised, the Apostle Paul says. And one old, one old time preacher said, no one will take the church seriously until the church starts taking itself seriously. Amen. And so often the churches in America are striving to be relevant rather than being in revival, which is true. And the American church is looking for social love rather than saints. And the churches, a lot of churches, sin isn't dealt with. It's, there's undisciplined sin. And there's a reason that the American church isn't fulfilling the Great Commission. There's a reason for it. There's a reason that we, I have heard so many different times from pastors from years down the line, preach and preach and preach and push and push their church to fulfill the Great Commission. I don't know how many hundreds of sermons I've heard on the Great Commission. I don't have a problem with preaching on the Great Commission. But this is, this is my little saying, I guess, little quip. We will never, and this is good to write down, we will never fulfill the Great Commission until we fulfill the Great Commandment. Think about that. Until we, until we fulfill the Great Commandment, we will never fulfill the Great Commission. And we, if we begin fulfilling the Great Commandment, you will not have to be preaching people blue in the face to go win the lost. Because there's going to be a love so amazing, so divine, that demands my all, all my time. There's something burning within. As a fire is shut up in my bones, as the prophet said, I cannot help but speak. That's right. And that's exactly what Tozer uh, uh, talked about. A.W. Tozer again. Tozer said himself, the church must be first spiritually worthy in order to go win the lost. Which backs up Luke chapter 24, if you would turn there with me very quickly. Luke 24. Luke 24, at the very end of the chapter, and verse 47. Luke 24, 47. Jesus is speaking and says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. How long should I tarry until ye be endued? You know what amazes me when I, when I read that? Here's the disciples of Jesus Christ in a very long, in a short, I don't want to get into this heavy. But they followed him for three and a half years. They broke bread with Jesus, they ate with Jesus, they saw him perform all these miracles. I mean, here is the king of kings in front of their face, and they followed him, slept with him, heard him pray, and yet Jesus says, don't do anything yet. You've been with me, but you need something else. And basically, that's what I had to do what I did, and that's the Holy Spirit. You make sure you get right first before you go out. You need to be in with that power from on high. And Tozer said again, you must be first spiritually worthy before you go out. Wait, wait, are you telling people don't go witness? Yeah. Because you're going to reproduce, as Tozer went on to say in that book, you're going to reproduce of what you are. If you look warm, you're going to have a lukewarm church. If you're hot, you're going to produce hot Christians. Amen. And that's exactly what's going on. We have to fulfill the great commandment first before we ever fulfill the great commission. Until then, we're going to struggle. And I want to say that God has not changed his mind on what the church should be for the last 2,000 years. Period. He has not changed his mind. God made a standard of what it should be. God made a blueprint of what it should be. And it's found in the New Testament. In the book of Acts. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said himself, I will build my church, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He said he's going to build his church. Hallelujah. 
And then we have those people complaining because they feel like they never get anything out of church. My question is for them, what are you giving to the church? If you look at the first three centuries, which I'm a big historical buff on historical accounts of revival, if you read and study on the first three centuries of revival, of the gospel moving forward, we see that there's a price to be paid when the gospel goes forward. In every century, in every revival, in every move of God, there's persecution afterwards. We read the book of Acts. We see that just in the book of Acts. When God's people repent and return to him, and all throughout history, men and women feel called to go. There's a going, there's, they feel called to be missionaries, they feel the call to, to go and pastor, to preach, but there's a burning sensation within them, I've got to let this out, I can't bottle this in. And actually here, my mind just goes to the uh, gentleman, I don't see him in here, but I met a, a gentleman here at Chick-fil-A here a, a couple of days ago. And he walked up to me and he said, brother, I feel led to talk to you. I'm 23 years old. He said, I want, I want to preach. He said, I can't, I, I, I got to preach. That's what I mean. He was, he was doing this. And I, I said, I can say you want to preach. But there, he had a desire. He had, you could tell he was zealous. You could tell he was passionate. He had, he had, I mean, there was something burning within him that he said, I have to get out. And I said, I've been 23 once. I know how it is. And I said, you got to, well, I get, I get into what I said to him. you got to pray as much as you can, study as much as you can, as Leonard, Leonard Ravenhill would say. you got to eat as much as you, eat as much as you can. <laughs> but there's, when, when a person returns, repents, gets right with God, they, they have a new desire and a new passion to win souls. Amen. And as C.H. Spurgeon said, you know you're saved. When you have an overwhelming desire to win the lost. I like that. You know you're saved when you have an overwhelming desire to win the lost. And when God's people repent, they cannot keep it bottled in, in, inside any longer. And beloved, not to be a doom and gloom again, but the level of darkness right now. <laughs> the level of darkness right now that we're seeing in America, in the churches, I believe, this is what I believe, is greater than the darkness that they saw in the 5th through the 13th century. And if you know anything about history, that was a dark time for the church. A very dark time. There's very little accounts of revival, and there's very little accounts of the gospel moving forward between the 5th century and the 13th century. When the 13th century came along, then we find we get Wycliffe. Wycliffe came onto the scene and moved on down the line. Not to bore you with details. But I believe we're seeing a very dark time. If we don't act now, it's going to get worse. I believe God is calling me. God is calling each of us now. Beloved, I, while I was praying for this meeting uh, here this, uh, this afternoon, God began to speak to my heart. He said, Brent, you need to call your wife back in Ohio and ask her to forgive you for anything and all things you've ever done wrong. I said, no, I don't want to do that, Lord. And then I don't know, I'm not going to bust you as you're preaching today. Whoever we've offended in the past, we've got to say, Lord, forgive me. It hurts. My flesh didn't want to do it, I'll be honest with you, because I'm a man. But when God's people repent, truly repent, and turn from their wicked ways, we've heard so many times, we're going to see healing. We're going to see brokenness. If we don't do it, God help us. In 1 Timothy 3.12, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3.12, they that desire to live godly shall not suffer. I want to know how many people know that verse. <laughs> they shall suffer all kind of ease and comfort. No. That's what I, I don't hear that verse preached a whole lot today. They that desire to live godly shall suffer persecution. They will suffer. And you know all the revivals in history, again, I'm saying this again, but the great ones that we ever read about, there was a great persecution afterwards. 
And when the church gets right, when you study historical accounts of revival, I don't care if it's from the 2nd century all the way through to the 21st century, there's great persecution. We can get into the revivals going on in China and different countries going on right now. There is revivals going on right now. Mm, amen. And a lot of times it's in the underground church. I've got a missionary friend in, in China right now. I, I correspond to, with him in email, and he's working strictly with the underground church. And it's an embarrassing moment for me to listen to him, what they're going through, compared to the church now. Because he said, they are meeting at midnight, 4 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, just to meet together and to have church. And they don't even have Bibles. He said, the majority of pastors do not have Bibles here. He said, that's what we're trying to do, is ship Bibles across the lines, and we can't get to them because we get caught very often. But these people are hungry for the bread of life. And that's what they call it. They call it the bread to get it across. Because they can't call it the Bibles and they're stuck. But it's the bread they're trying to get across to the Christians and the brethren. But there's revival going on right now. And they're hungry. And they're being persecuted. That was my whole point. They that desire to live godly shall suffer persecution, period. And I know in America that's not popular at all. And when the church gets right with God, the scripture says she cannot but help speak and, uh, and say the things which you've seen and heard. She can't, because there's something again burning within. Now listen to this for a moment. I'm actually going to read you some gospel writings from an account of revivals from the third century. This is a very short paragraph. This man named Julian, who was a ruler at this time, and I quote to you, Julian is said to have, he, he, was, he was a persecutor, he was persecuting Christians, he hated Christians, you're going to, of course, you're going to hear that in two seconds. But Julian is said to have counted it policy not to put the Christian openly to death. Now I'm going to say that again, because I want you to grasp that. Julian is said to have counted it policy not to put the Christian openly to death, because he perceived they were like new mown grass. The oftener, the oftener it was cut down, the thicker it sprang up again. He stopped them from persecuting and killing them openly because the church was growing at a rapid pace. And that's not the only account that I've ever read like that. It's happened tremendously a lot throughout great revivals in history. In other words, these Christians were so zealous for God that there was no stopping them. That's what he's saying. I can't stop these people, so let's just stop killing them openly. And here recently, or maybe about six years ago, I read a newspaper, newspaper article from, some, from a missionary uh, ministry. They said the church, I can remember vaguely, they said the church in China is rapidly growing the more it gets persecuted. It just keeps on going. They that desire to live godly shall suffer persecution. And you look at the church now, and then, then there was patience. And I know some of you have read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody read that book? Very good book. But all, but even not even just in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, just reading the historical accounts of revival overall, we see that people are being burned, amputated, limbs being cut off, horrible things, cutting, cutting them into pieces. Of course, we can read about stuff like that in Sudan right now. But what intrigues me, and as know some of you have already read, as I read and read and read about this, how they smiled, how they sang praises, and there was no anger or violence in, in their voice or their countenance at all, they said. And then I look at some of the churches that I've personally been in, some of the churches that I've personally pastored. Hot tempers flare up over something petty, the carpet, of the, the color of the carpet. Or what's someone doing in the board meeting that's, you know, though so-and-so shouldn't be saying that in the board meeting. Or, you know, just petty, petty stuff. 
tempers flare up over trivial things in the church. And I thought, God, how are, how are we going to suffer persecution if we can't even handle our own problems, as I said at the very beginning? In 1 Corinthians 4.13, the Apostle Paul says again, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things. Now I ask myself that question, am I the filth of the world? Am I that diligent in seeking God and trying to win souls for Jesus Christ? The woman with the issue of blood many years dealt with this disease. But she finally got to the cross. She got to the old rugged cross. She got to the answer. As Lent member Leonard Raymond Hill said, the cross has all the answers, north, west, east, east and south. It has directions for every answer. And he's right. But she finally got to the cross. She got to Jesus Christ. She didn't care what it was. She pressed through the crowd. She bulldozed, I guess some say, but some theologians through the crowd. And that's what we've got to do. And then I asked, what are you? What do I? Or what is your church? Or what is your family to get, need to get nailed to the cross? What hinders revival? And I know we've heard it and we're going to continue to hear it, but what hinders revival for us right now? After hearing all this, what the Holy Spirit has said, I don't really care what you've heard me say. It's the Holy Spirit that I want you to listen to. Amen? What do you need to get nailed, and what do I need to get nailed to the cross? Is the cross being lifted in my house? Is the cross being lifted with my children? Is the cross being lifted in all these areas of my life, in the workplace? Is the cross being lifted up? 1 John 2, 17, it says, and the world passes away, right? Everybody see that? Yeah. Passes away. How many, raise your hands, how many of you believe the world is getting further and further away from God? Everybody. Okay. Brian, for a moment, is going to, oops, that shot is right here. Brian, for a moment, is going to be God. Okay? Just bear with me. He's going to be God. He's going to be the world. <laughs> We should be holding tight with God as close as we can. Elementary, Sunday school teaching, amen? This, we're trying to keep our distance away from the world, as well as the world. Go ahead, you stay there, go ahead, walk a few steps that way. And what's happening, keep going, uh, three more steps. In the American church, Christianity abroad, what we're trying to do is keep our distance away from the world, right? Keep our distance away from the world. You hear what I said? The world is passing away, getting further away from God. He's walking away from God. Script, scripture, we just read it. What I'm trying to do, the church or a Christian, what a lot of people are doing, I'm keeping my distance away from the world. I'm keeping my distance away from the world. See, I'm trying to keep my distance. I'm trying to make my conscience please. Keeping my distance. Close to me. Where's God? See, the world's passing away from God. What the church is doing is trying to keep her distance from the world. A safe distance. But all along, as the world passes away, we're getting further away from God. Thank you. So, if anything I say, I hope that maybe drove home the point. And that is exactly what's happening in our American culture. We're getting further and further and further away from God. Because we're trying to keep a safe distance from the world. But if you think, Brian, God was over there. The world was here. Remember what I said? The world was here. And the world was here. So in actuality, we're becoming more worldly. But someone... I used to have a friend, I used to pass him, he said, make it plain, preacher. He used to scream out all the time at me. I loved it. 
but we're getting, rather than, keep, rather than just say we're trying to keep a safe distance, the fact is we're getting more worldly and more worldly and more worldly and more worldly. We, we, we reflect the world. I was talking to someone the other day, and, and I was talking to him after studying a lot on the historical accounts of revival here just recently. It's, it's unbelievable. When you read the accounts of revival, the great moves of God in the past, I mean, rather than Finney or Moody or Wesley or whoever you want to talk about, or the Canadian revival or well, Wales revival, but all the centuries. When you look at the churches back then, and you look at them now, it's a horse of a different color. You can't even recognize it anymore. Actually, I was kind of interested in what Steve Gallagher was going to preach. I get to watch it on video, hopefully, at, at Sermon Index here in a couple weeks. But what the Apostle, remember what him saying in the pulpit, what the Apostle Paul would do today. But I think this may sum up what John Sung said. I love, I love the writings of John Sung. And I remember Leonard Ravenhill in his video said that John Sung, the biography of him, was the greatest thing he, he ever read outside the New Testament. John Sung said this, Prayer will bring the church back as nothing else will. For, as pray, for a praying church is a repentant church and, it, and an obedient church. Let me say that one more time, because that's worth saying, that's worth worthy of saying again. Prayer will bring the church back as nothing else will. For a praying church is a repentant church and an obedient church. And it brings overall what he's trying to say, God, back into the church. You've heard that old saying, that missionary that came from China. They said, what astounded you about America? They said, how much the church can do without God? I know some of us have heard that many, many times. That's true. Even Daniel Webster, the Webster's Dictionary, says when he visited the America out west, he said, what, is, what spoke to you the most? He said, I'll give you four words, and I don't think I can remember, remember all four words, but he said, luxury, declension, the other two are, I can't think of, but those two stuck out my mind more than anything. Luxury and declension. I think the other one was desolation. Now, I'm not trying to, again, make us all unhappy and feel bad, but there's, there's coming a point where we need to be like that woman at Bob Evans I was just describing. That's right. That we've got to cry out. I, I believe firmly in the grace of God. Thank God for His grace and His mercy endures forever. But we're at a point, way past the point, way past the safety line, that we need to start crying out more than ever before in the history of the church, beloved. And I'm preaching to myself this morning. I'm just not up here tooting my horn. But we need to pray harder and more fervent than ever. And we need to be more repentant, Brent, than ever. Amen. Amen. Than ever. We need to be more, we need to be walking in the light than ever before. As I said at the very beginning, the church has lost her respect. And in order to gain it back, we've got to allow God to be in control again. Amen. 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 That's all I have to say to you. Hope you got some good out of it. The Lord spoke to you. The Lord spoken to me. I don't know. I, I pray that God wouldn't even speak to you, that He'd speak to me through this message.